Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. Then they led him away to crucify him. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. And Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. You 
came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. Good evening, Chicago, Illinois, United States, and the world. We greet you in the only name that we know that has power, authority, wisdom, and might, the master's name of Jesus the Christ. We greet you from the sanctuary of the Apostolic Faith Church here in Chicago, and we are so grateful to the Lord that you have joined us by way of airways, by way of technology on various social media platforms. But tonight, even though many of us and all of us may be practicing social distancing, but tonight, I guarantee you, you can draw close to him and close to us. Like a rose trampled on the ground, he, he took the fall. I'm talking about the Lord Jesus, our Messiah. He took the fall and he thought of you and I. He looked down eternity and saw you and saw me. In our pitiful condition, he loved us, even though we did not love him then. But Christ's love superseded our sins. So tonight, we're glad that you can join us. Listen, many of you have been a part uh, of these telecasts and these kinds of presentations for many, many years. But tonight, it's a little bit different, this Good Friday celebration. We're not gathered in crowds physically, but we are gathered in numbers spiritually across this nation and across the world, we pray for you. I've said this in the very beginning of this pandemic called COVID. Have you ever thought about three months ago that you would think that there will be one subject on the mind of every sentient human being on earth, on every continent, across all ethnicities, across all cultures? Every person is aware of the COVID-19 virus. It is so humbling. And I think that it would teach us that we're all human. We're the same. We make differences, but God sees us as one. The Word says, from one blood, he made us all. So tonight, we come to talk about that, the redemptive power of Jesus Christ, the power of Calvary, 
the power of universal redemption purchased at a cross by Christ the Lord. So tonight we greet you in Jesus' name. Listen, many of you have been a part of this, as I said before, and this week, beginning on Palm Sunday, uh, you were able to drive up and receive from us uh, those communion packets. And so tonight, we will join together as a people. I know there's at least two or 3,000 of you who came by our church, picked up your element, you're sheltered in place with your family. What greater expression of community than a family joining together and remembering Christ in communion? For those of you who perhaps were not able to do that, we still connect you in a very powerful way. In fact, just to my left here is the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ is our tradition in our church that every year, beginning again in the Lenten season, beginning on Holy Week, we put a cross like this one uh, in our facility. And we invite you to call in. And listen, thousands upon thousands of you, you've called in, you've emailed, you've gone on social media, and we have written out every single request and nailed it to that cross. On last year, we had close to 10,000 requests of prayer. And tonight, I'm going to ask those leaders and pastors that are with me to join me by the cross. And we're going to pray and believe God for you, for your requests. There is no distance in God. He is open and he hears and answers prayer. And so tonight we'll do that with you as you join with us in community, in communion, in the name of Jesus Christ. Listen, if you're going through anything, call our church. And all of those pastors that are listed uh, on the program that you're watching that will be coming tonight, call their church. You don't have to call here, but I'll guarantee you that the church of the living God stands ready in this crisis to meet your needs and to reach out in a powerful way. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your denomination is. I don't care what your belief system is. We love you with the love of Jesus, and I will guarantee you your need will be met some way, somehow, by the church of the living God. So tonight, we thank and praise God for each of you. Listen, tonight is called Good Friday. There's a controversy about that. I'm not sure if he died on the Friday, but I do know he died. I know he died on the 13th day of Nisan. The Bible is very clear about it. And tonight we're going to talk about just what happened. I always challenge my leaders and my pastors in our church that beginning on Palm Sunday, we should take each day from Sunday to the next Sunday and think each day about what was on the mind of Jesus. The scripture is so clear as he walked with them from Bethany where he raised Lazarus. From there, going into Jerusalem on that faithful Palm Sunday, riding in triumph, hearing hosannas, but Jesus' heart was not about the hosannas. He understood where he was going. He was pointing toward Calvary. Calvary is the single most important event in my mind in human history. The song says, years I spent in vanity and pride. Caring not, my Lord was crucified. Knowing not, it was for me he died at Calvary. Mercy there was great. Grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Someone said, what a strange religion. But a symbol of shame, suffering, and death should be the core value of their faith. It was, in fact, his death at Calvary's cross. So tonight, we ask you to join with us as we share from faith leaders across this city the seven last words of Jesus. Again, what an important event. The Bible says that Jerusalem was filled during that time, that week, with travelers from across the world. They had come to Jerusalem to worship the Passover. They had come to celebrate the city was teeming with people. What they did not all understand is that Jesus Christ was at the precipice of his greatest challenge. If you walk again through John's gospel, he will tell you he met with them in the upper room where they celebrated, again, communion, and they, he washed their feet. They went out from there to the garden. St. John 15, he says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Some of Jesus' most intimate words were expressed during these hours right before his death. He went from there to Gethsemane, 
where he again cried out, Father, is there any other way? Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Another occasion I will share with you the physiologic passion of Jesus. Even the medical terminology is frightening. Yes, he was crucified, but he died from suffocation. He died from dehydration. He died having been whipped all night long with cords, whipped for no reason but hatred and evil men, pressed a crown of thorns in his head, caused him to carry a cross up Golgotha's hill. Some assistance from Simon, an African-American, a, a, not a, but an African, a, a, a black man carried his cross. Isn't that so noble? They put him on that cross and he hung there between two thieves. Again, the whole world stopped for a moment. Listen, every promise in your Bible was paid for at Calvary. Everything God ever said was stamped, paid in full at Calvary's cross. It was Christ, fully God and fully man, who suffered for us. And so let us walk together tonight and hear the words of Jesus. And I believe tonight for each of you, no matter what your state may be, Christ is going to speak to you clearly and eloquently from his cross. The Bible talks about it again throughout the Gospels, the word of the Lord. In Luke chapter 23, in verse 33, he begins to cry this, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. To kick off Christ speaking from the cross, the great pastor of Progressive Baptist Church, Pastor Charlie Dates. Well, this is the day that the Lord has made, and even at home, sheltering in place, we can rejoice and be glad in it. I don't want to take up my time with too many preliminaries, but I must. And please permit me uh, to thank God for my bishop, uh, the bishop, Dr. Horace Smith, <clears throat> for his remarkable leadership, uh, for his gentlemanly character, for his excellent choice in wife. Um, he married the one and only Dr. Susan Smith, and uh, for their uh, unexplainable and undeserved kindness to my family and I want to say thank you. Uh, the first piece of gold from Golgotha can be found in Luke chapter 23. I want to read into your hearing verse 34. Hear now Jesus saying these words from the cross. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. I, I want to just for about eight minutes, if I may argue this thought from this text tonight, I, I want to argue, forgive me, don't forget me. Our Father in heaven, would you grant now me grace to preach your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Some things... Only God can say to God. And tonight, at this first cry from the cross, we eavesdrop, as it were, on the absolving transaction of the Trinity. There Jesus hangs. Can you see him? Suspended between a sovereign heaven and a sorrowing earth. Lifted a few feet above fallen humanity. And dangling far below paradise as he knew it, pendulous between a thief and a thug. Can you see Jesus? And what do we find Jesus doing in the most torturous hour of his life? We find him praying. Because prayer, friends, is the greatest privilege available to mankind. But sadly, rather than treating prayer as a privilege, we tend to act as if prayer is a precaution. Isn't it amazing that the very first word that Jesus utters from the cross is a word of prayer? It's as if Jesus is saying that prayer for the Christian must be our first response and not our last resort. By praying on the cross, Jesus teaches us 
how to handle life when all hell breaks loose. He says, in a matter of words, that prayer works. I don't think you heard me, so I want to say the record of history is clear. Prayer works. Abraham prayed, and he received the gift of faith. Jacob prayed, and he came to discover that sometimes prayer will not change your circumstance before it changes you. Moses prayed and locusts rained down from heaven. The Nile ran south in blood. And he prayed again and the Red Sea stood up on two sides. Joshua prayed and the walls of Jericho fell down flat. Ruth prayed and found a kinsman redeemer. Esther prayed and saved an entire nation from certain death. David prayed and slew a giant with a sling and a stone. Solomon prayed in an empty temple. Isaiah prayed in a cloudy temple. Jeremiah prayed with resignation papers in his back hand. Hosea prayed with divorce papers in his hands. Daniel prayed all night long. Jabez prayed one quick prayer. Paul and Silas prayed at midnight. Peter prayed at daybreak. But tonight we see Jesus praying on a cross because prayer works. And yet, don't you find it puzzling or at least curious? That the first word, the very first prayer, is an intercessory request for forgiveness. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Maybe Jesus prayed this as a model for us because Jesus understood our temptation to hold grudges, to harbor ill will, and to, like Jonah, wish the demise of our enemies. But we see in Jesus something different on the cross. Seneca, the Roman philosopher, tells us, that the crucified shouted from the cross some of the most ugly things imaginable to humanity. They cursed the day of their birth. They cursed their executioners. Some of them cursed their mothers and even spat down on those who looked upon them. But in the moment where Jesus could be cussing, we find him praying because a relationship with the Father will make places where you want to cuss turn you into a praying saint. Maybe the people around him thought, that he would give up on that whole love your enemies doctrine. Maybe they thought he would abandon that pray for those who despitefully use you beatitude. But because he startled them in this moment, it startles us. Listen again. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Isn't it amazing that Jesus gets something in this prayer that you and I have yet to learn? That our prayers are to be prayed with accurate designation and with preemptive consideration. You better be careful who you're praying to. Sometimes people pray just to be heard by themselves. Sometimes people pray so that other folk hear them. But listen to whom Jesus prays. Father, forgive them. In directing his prayer to God, Jesus teaches us to whom the real offense of sin belongs. Sin is first a crime against God before it is a misdemeanor among men. How might this theological appropriation of sin change human history if we actually understood our lawlessness to be against God and not merely against our fellow man? But friends, I think we lessen the force and we weaken the gravity of our need for forgiveness because we do not see our sin first as misconduct against God. Slavery would have never happened in America if the founding fathers of this nation had viewed African people as made in the image of God and not chattel for profit. Jim Crow would have never happened if we saw our crimes against humanity as first an offense against God. And right now, poor people in Chicago who live on food stamps would be able to have their groceries delivered to their door if we saw people as made in the image and the likeness of God as though it were a crime against God before it's a crime against humanity. But friends, I want to tell you in my closing moment that to err is human, but to forgive is divine. I'm holding on. Y'all help me hold on. The error is with us, but the forgiveness is of God. It says to us in this text that forgiveness must first come from God before it can be given to men. 
Bible readers know that we cannot have God if we do not forgive. But what we often miss, Bishop, is that God couldn't have us if he didn't first forgive us. So on the cross, we see Jesus as the supply of his own demand. What Jesus tells us to do, he does for us first. I'm out of time, but can I say thank God that on that cross, he delivered me. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. Somebody shout hallelujah. You at home, give the Lord praise in your living room and in your bedroom, wherever you are, because forgiveness came from God. Hallelujah. He supplied the demand, and he's still doing it right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. What a mighty God we serve, and we praise him for that powerful, powerful word in the name of Jesus. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Somebody said that Jesus stopped dying for a moment to intercede on our behalf. The second word. The Bible says one of the other malefactors were hanged with him, railed on him, saying things like this, if you really be Christ, save yourself and save us. But the other one rebuked him saying, do you not fear or reverence God? He understood, seeing that we are in this same condemnation justly, but this man has done nothing wrong. He then turns to the Lord and says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And the Lord promised him, verily, truly, I say unto you, today you will be with me in paradise. Pastor Sandra Riley, just for you, ministries in Jesus' name. Give God great praise. God bless you. I am just so thankful for this opportunity to be a part of such a wonderful occasion. I want to say, first of all, thank you, uh, Bishop Smith, for inviting me and allowing me to participate in this event. I thank God for you. I thank God for your lovely wife and my dear friend of long time, uh, Susan, uh, Sister Susan Smith. Come on, you all. Let's give her a hand. Let's give her a hand. I'm thankful. And God, I thank God for each and every one of you. Father, we thank you for those who are viewing us tonight. I ask that you would bless. I ask that you would strengthen. I ask that you would speak. Speak to their hearts. Speak to the souls. Speak to the minds of your people right now in the name of Jesus. Father, strengthen, help, uplift, inspire in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to look here at Luke chapter number uh, 23, and um, I want to read a few verses very quickly. Uh, verse, let's start at verse number 42 and read verses 42 and 43. It reads as follows, Luke 23, 42 and 43, and he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Jesus is on the cross, hanging between two thieves. Of all the places for these thieves to die, they are dying next to Jesus. Punishment by death on the cross was confined to slaves and malefactors of the worst kind. The two thieves were completely guilty, paying their debt to society. Jesus was completely innocent, uh, paying our debt for sin. 
Jesus fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah 53 and 12, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the intercessors. The two male factors were crucified together. They, they were equally near to Jesus Christ. Both of them saw and heard all that had transpired during the past several hours. Both were notoriously wicked and suffering accurately. Both were dying and urgently in need of forgiveness. Between these two is Jesus the Christ, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. While Jesus hung on the cross in pain and agony, his mission for coming to the world was now being accomplished. However, it appears that Jesus had lost all power to save others or himself while he was hanging on that cross. Both thieves had marched along with him through the streets of Jerusalem and had seen him sink beneath the weight of the cross. This was probably the first time that the thieves had ever set eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, they see him under every circumstance of weakness and disgrace. His enemies were triumphing over him. His friends had mostly forsaken him. Public opinion was unanimously against him. His very crucifixion was regarded as utterly inconsistent with his messiahship. Even those who had believed on Jesus were now made to doubt him because of his crucifixion and in the midst of all of this one thief says to Jesus in verse number 39 if thou be Christ save thyself and us he speaks uh, with a mixture of sarcasm and selfishness to save his own life knowing that he was hanging as a guilty man but the other often referred to as the thief on the right. He looked over the obstacles and he looked over the difficulties that stood in the way of his faith and apprehended that he was hanging next to not a guilty man but a savior, a lord and a king. Ah, we, we, we don't know the man's name. We don't know his age and the, or the specific specific uh, details of his crime. So based on the ambiguity of the man's identity in the text, it might be safe to conclude that he had never seen a miracle, that he had never heard a sermon, that he was self a self-confessed criminal, that he was a crucified robber, but suddenly the dying thief, this sinner, takes a suffering, bleeding, crucifying man as his savior and his king. So he cried, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom because I've identified that you got to be a king and every king has a kingdom. So when you leave here, you got to be going somewhere else. If you can find a seat, could you just remember me? If you could find a little space could you just remember me? He was an outcast from society. Who would remember him? The public didn't want to think about him anymore. Who would remember him? His friends were glad to forget him. Who would remember him? His family was glad to forget about the disgrace that he had brought to the family. Who would remember him? It was reasonable for Jesus to forget him. But here, Jesus lets him know. Now, don't you worry about it, son. It's not too late. I'm like FedEx. I got same day delivery. I can deliver you today. I can bring you out today. Come on here, somebody. I, I gotta close. I, I gotta close, but, 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 but here, I don't know 
his name. But John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I don't know what the man's name is, but on that day, it became whosoever. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that on the right day, I took on the name of whosoever. I came to Jesus just as I was, weary, wounded, and sad, but I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. Thank God for first and same day delivery. Glory. Come on, somebody. Come on, thieves. Come on, robbers. Come on, guilty people. Today, 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 right now, I don't care what you've done today. Woo! Without delay, today, you are going to be with me in a place of rest, paradise, where every need shall be met. Hallelujah. What a mighty God we serve. Hallelujah. Hanging on the cross, dying, yet forgiving, dying, but yet saving, dying, but yet thinking about you and I, somebody else. What a mighty God we serve. The third word from Calvary's cross will be preached to us and shared with us by a man who understands what this recent pandemic is about. Just lost his sister a few days ago. I called him, he said, Bishop, I'm going to be there. My sister was saved. But again, somebody who understands what we're going through. Pastor Marshall Hatch is no stranger to us from the New Mount Pilgrim Baptist Church. He's preaching from the text in John chapter 19. Notice, now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus, therefore, saw his mother and the disciples standing by, whom he loved, he says to his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold thy mother. From that hour, that disciple took that mother as his own into his own home. Pastor Marshall Hatch. Oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. The Lord is still good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth yet endures to all generations. God, we thank you for this precious privilege you give us to share on this night. We thank you for this powerful pastor, for this team of ministry, and now we thank you for this good Friday that started out as a bad Friday, but we thank you that you're the God who turns good out of bad situations. And so now we pray you'd bless us to go forth this day in Jesus' name. And every heart said, Amen. Amen. And bless God. The scripture has been read, John chapter 19, and our pericope of the text, verse 25, 26, and 27. And our theme is this adoption transaction that happens here at Calvary. I want to report, as is reported in verse 25, that the women are at the cross, that there are three Marys at the cross. They're there to witness the crucifixion and the completion of the mission. And so I thank God that when we look at who Jesus is and what he has done, he has included in his ministry, the ministry of women, the ministry of women, women are at the cross. They're at the cross, and it is this time that separates the old world from the new world. Jesus is the bringer in of the modern world, that, that those who are male and female are one in Christ. The women are at the cross. And so it's here, this dual adoption that on the surface seems unremarkable, uh, but it is 
this cross of Calvary that no words can be wasted, that no uh, time can be wasted for this place, this place, this space called Calvary is a place for final words and final moments. And everything that happens at Calvary has profound meaning and impact. And so here we have this adoption transaction that seems unremarkable on the face for it is here that John is now united with Mary as mother and son and Jesus in this seemingly unremarkable act has carried out a high purpose of divinity. First of all, notice here he satisfies the, an important need. Jesus, Jesus is dying, but, 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 but this is an important matter of provision. Jesus must die, but Mary must live. And so Jesus uses this opportunity to make sure that Mary is cared for, that this, will, this woman has one who would be a covering over her that would help to provide for her need. And isn't it good news that the Lord is always attentive to the practicality of provision, that he's not so high and lifted up that our needs are beyond his matter of concern, but he is always concerned about providing for his children. I want those of you that are home, you may be in a place where you feel desperate and lacking, but I want you to know that the Lord is attentive to your needs. He runs the universe, but he is also looking at you. He knows your address. And he whose eye is on the sparrow is now also on Mary and her needs. This, this is, this is one scene that Jesus discharges with that responsibility. Secondly, he shows that as he discharges with this responsibility to make sure that Mary is cared for, he must see after Mary now as a matter of principle because the son of God is also the eldest son of Mary. Here is the principle of that fifth commandment to honor the father and the mother, which means not bow down, but it is a principle of reciprocity. It means that you are now responsible to take care of the one who took care of you when you couldn't help yourself. You must now sow back into the place out of which you have received. It is the commandment of reciprocity. And brothers and sisters, we have to be careful to know that when we do our responsibility, that is spiritual. It seems mundane, but Jesus in the midst of bringing grace also keeps the law. He keeps the law that he has now honored his mother by making sure that her needs are taken care of as he separates himself from the terrestrial shores of this planet. And then finally, if you look closely, Jesus says, now woman, behold your son, meaning John will now be your son. Son, behold your mother. Now John, you to treat him as your son. It reveals finally a trust and a charge. Jesus leaves this disciple whom he loves a charge. And it's an interesting way that John puts it finally. He said the disciple whom he loves. And even in the midst of it, John is trying his best to demonstrate modesty. But I detect there's a little disciple rivalry still going on. John is saying that the one that you loved, which means that I believe I see myself as your favorite disciple. And I don't want to bother anybody, but I believe that there might have been a conversation when John and Peter got to heaven and Peter probably thought he was the greatest and the most favored disciple. He said, I preached at Pentecost 
and 3,000 souls were added and there were healings uh, that came from me that I was one who was renowned as one who led the church that comes out of Rome. But I come to tell you, brothers and sisters, John said, I got a case to make. My case is that number one, while you all were hiding somewhere, there was one disciple that stood by the cross and, and he said not only that, when you get through bragging about you were his favorite, I want you to remember that before he went home, he left his mama, I'm excuse me, mother, in my hands. And all I'm trying to tell you is John says that he trusted me with his mother. And I'm going to leave you tonight when I tell you, make your way to the cross. But when you make your way to the cross, don't forget the spirit of John. Because so many times we come to the cross with our petitions and requests. But I thank God that John did not come to the cross with a petition, but he left with an assignment. And I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm so glad that I came to the cross. And I told the Lord, if you want somebody, you can depend on me if you need somebody. Oh, here am I. Send me, I'll go. God bless you tonight. Woo. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Left with the responsibility. Didn't beg for anything but left with the greatest gift. What a mighty God we serve. Give the Lord praise for our dear brother, Pastor Marshall Hatch. All of you at home right now in Jesus' name, I know you're excited. Just stay tuned. Just keep on being connected in the name of the Lord. You're receiving the gold nuggets from the cross of Calvary as Jesus speaks one more time to us. Over 2,000 years ago it happened, yet he's still speaking right now. The Bible speaks now something very powerful. It says something that we often miss in our westernized way of looking at time. The Bible says from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, there was darkness. When it should be bright as day, at noontime, there's darkness. He's already forgiven the world. He's made a way for the disciple, rather the thief. He's cared for his human relationships. But now the scene shifts. Darkness. The veil of the temple is rent. And the Bible says he cried with a loud voice. Eli, Eli, lama sabethani. That is to say, my God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? Pastor Angela Williams from Chicago Apostolic Church. Give God praise for her as she comes in Jesus' name. Praise God. Thank you so much, Bishop Smith and Susan Smith. You all are here at Apostolic Faith Church for such a time as this. And I thank God for both of you. I thank God for your ministry. The Bible tells us in Matthew 27 and 45, the Passion Translation, it says, for three hours beginning at noon, darkness came over the earth, and at three o'clock Jesus shouted with a mighty voice in Aramaic, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you deserted me? For three hours, beginning at noon, darkness came over the earth. On the day that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ hung from Calvary's cross, bearing the sins of the world, darkness covered the earth. It was no ordinary darkness. 
It was a supernatural darkness. It was a darkness that defied explanation. People tried to come up with words to describe what was going on and were left speechless. And it was a darkness that lasted. It was a darkness that set the stage. It was at this very moment that God the Father, in his ultimate and unfathomable wisdom, allowed his son Jesus to be nailed to the cross, hanging between two criminals. But through the grace of Holy Spirit, there is what we now know was the ultimate battle that took place. On the one side, there were the principalities of darkness seeking to damn humanity. On the other side, we see the heavenly army in partnership with Jesus on the cross singing, seeking to redeem humanity throughout multiple generations. That is the battle of all battles, the battle to change the course of human history. Darkness is associated with judgment. In darkness, there's a feeling of despair and dis desperation, hopelessness and abandonment, loneliness, betrayal and disappointment. It is in darkness that pain is exacerbated. Three hours of darkness. And at three o'clock, Jesus shouted with a mighty voice. Can you just imagine suffering in darkness, suffering the consequences and circumstances not of your own making? Can you even imagine the thoughts racing through your mind in darkness? Why me? When is this going to be over? How long do I have to suffer through this? I can't take it anymore. Can someone just take this pain away from me? But Jesus shouted with a mighty voice. He was loud. He was strong. He wanted by bystanders to know I'm still here. I have something to say. I'm not whispering under my breath. I'm not moaning and grumbling and mumbling. I've got a word. I've got a voice even in the darkness. Even in the darkness, I have something to say. It may not be what you want to hear. It may not even be something that you understand. But listen. I have a question, and the question is this, my God, my God, why have you deserted me? As a trial lawyer, I understand the importance of questions. There is something that goes into the framing of the question in order to get the answer that you want to hear. And in this case, what God said is, I, my God, I still have a connection to you. And when he said, my God, is saying I'm in a relationship, and no matter what my human body is experiencing right now, I still trust you. I'm not going to ask irrelevant questions. I'm not going to waste your time on... Why did they choose me? Why didn't I get immunity? Why were those criminals let go and I'm here? I didn't do anything wrong. Why did they beat me? He asked the relevant question. God, my God, why would you abandon me now? Just like the psalmist said in Psalm 22, starting at verse 1, the same lament before Jesus got on the cross, the psalmist captured when he said, Why do you remain distant, refusing to answer my tearful cries in the day and my desperate cries for your help in the night? I can't stop sobbing. Where are you, my God? Lord, you are the one who cared for me ever since I was a baby. Give me back my life. Save me from this violent death. Save my precious one and only from the power of these demons. Save me from all the power of the enemy. But abandonment is not the whole story. We must bear in mind that the human Jesus gave expression to what he felt in his physical self. But there was more to it. There's a question many of us may be even asking tonight. But I stop by to tell you, that three hours is a season. Three days is a season. Three months is a season. But guess what? 
The precedent has been set. Because in Exodus 10, 21, we find that just before the death angel passed over, the Israelites in Egypt, the plague of darkness covered the earth for three days. For three days, they couldn't see what was going on to the right or to the left. But the Bible tells us that the Hebrews still had some light. And then in Exodus 12, 12, God tells Moses, I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you. We know the end of this story. So we need to open up our mouths and begin to use words of resurrection life and power. We must declare tonight that out of the darkness, I see the breaking of a new day. In that new day, I see order coming out of chaos. In the new day, I see miracles, signs, and wonders. In the new day, I see captives being set free. Minds are opened up to new possibilities. There's a breaking of the poverty mindset. The economy is going to be right-sized. Racial inequities are going to be exposed and addressed. There's going to be ownership in our communities. There's going to be businesses being restored. There's going to be quality education opening up the young minds. There's a vision for a new Chicago. There's a vision for a new Illinois. There's a vision for a new United States of America. I'm so glad tonight that darkness doesn't last always. There's a new day coming. The light of the world is just waiting to shine brighter than ever before. We have hope. We walk in fellowship. There is no big I and little you anymore. There's no privilege and exclusivity in this new day. There is a reality about the frailty of the human condition. There is a recognition and acceptance that without Jesus, we cannot overcome. In this new day, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there are more that we can do. We are overcomers through Christ Jesus. We need to come to ourselves and we must say, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Tonight, on April 10th, 2020, we stand here in the third hour. Darkness is all around us. We feel the forces of death trying to attach themselves to us. We feel that loneliness trying to seep in. But what I'm here to say is that we need to shout to the Lord, rise, shine, for the glory of the Lord is here. We must command the sick Take up your beds and walk. We speak those things that are not as though they were. We declare that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. We command your spirit man right now to rise up. We command that you leave the bondages of sin and follow the cross. Follow the leading of Holy Spirit. Receive the gift that the Lord has brought to you. We declare tonight that our identity in Christ is solidified and that this land knows the one who bore the burdens of the cross for our sins. The land knows the power of darkness has been broken. And so I want to leave you with the declaration found in Psalm 22, starting at verse 27. The psalmist said, from the four corners of the earth, the peoples of the world will remember and return to the Lord. Every nation will come and worship him. For the Lord is king of all, who takes charge of all the nations. There they are. They're worshiping. The wealthy of this world will feast in fellowship with him right alongside the humble of heart, bowing down to the dust, forsaking their own souls. They will all come and worship their worthy king. His spiritual seed shall serve him. Future generations will hear from us about the wonders of the sovereign Lord. We declare tonight that the battle has been won. So we declare tonight, I command you to pass over, pass over, pass over. Hallelujah.
Give the Lord praise. Give the Lord high praise. Wow. Wow. The night season, the Bible says that those who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Wherever you are tonight, sheltering in place, wherever you are feeling like darkness is overcoming you, it's only a season. The light is coming. The debt is being paid even now at the foot of Calvary's cross, and your deliverance has already been won by the power of the Lord. The next word of Jesus from Calvary's cross is a powerful word. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he says something so mundane, but so basic and so necessary. I thirst. The pastor of the Rehoboth Apostolic Worship Center, Pastor Yolanda Hunt. Somebody say, wow. wow. The Lord has spoken to us so far so amazingly. It's, his heart has been revealed, and I'm just excited. First, I'm going to give thanks to my bishop, my pastor, and to his very fine wife, Lady Smith. Thank you tonight for this great opportunity to be here on Good Friday, to share in the seven last words of Jesus on this awesome, awesome Good Friday. Getting us ready for Resurrection Sunday. Making us ready for the celebration that's to come. Hallelujah. And I want to, if you'd be so kind, turn your attention to St. John chapter 19. The verses that I want to allude to, thank you so much, are the 28th verse and the 29th verse. I'd like to, if you allow me to, couple with those verses reading from St. John chapter 18 as well but I will refer to those during the time of the message. From St. John chapter 19, verse 28 says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was a set vessel full of vinegar, and they filled it with a sponge, it was filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon his and put it to his mouth. Jesus cries, I thirst. I thirst. Father, we thank you so much. We honor you and we lift you up for you are a great God. There is none like you, none beside you, O Savior. Be ye lifted up. Be glorified tonight in and through us. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. I, it is my endeavor to talk to you about the thirst is on. The thirst is on. There's some particular points I want to bring to your attention just to uh, make reference of some things I believe Jesus wants us to walk away with out of using two words that will speak to us three great points. Sometimes when we come into this season, yes, we were reflection of the things that our Savior experienced, and we make our hearts ready for us coming together and to celebrate, but this year, we are under a very different set of circumstances. So different that I believe that every true believer has been shuttered spiritually, shaken to a point where the questions are asked, what do you thirst for? What is it that you have your focus on, your desire for? What, what is it that you're really striving for? I would tell you that over these weeks, with enthusiasm constantly rising within me, I have had the opportunity to share my joy with some of my colleagues and some friends and talk about I'm just looking forward to what God's going to do because I'm, I'm, I'm sold out. I'm on fire. And some responses I've, had, I've heard have kind of been disappointing from some of my colleagues, pastors, have said, this is hard. This is way too much. I don't know how long I can take this speaking to a camera. You know, see, we have gotten so used to 
getting the response, and particularly for black preachers, African-American preaching, we have a style, call and response. We say something, y'all say something back. We draw our energy from the crowd. And our greatest moments are when the crowd is with us. When we can look out and see somebody who, who is identifying with what we're saying who, or, 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 or who are favorite people that sit in the right place. Because pastors, sometimes I look at folk that are sitting and I look away that their face is not good and I look at somebody who's smiling and I preach to that individual. But today, we, in this time, we're talking to a camera. And, but when we talk to the camera, we're talking to those that God has called to this time of a meeting. As Bishop said it, all over the world, the attention now is toward God. As we experience this pandemic, people have many cries. There, there, are, there is exposure that uh, our previous minister spoke of, uh, things that we see, racial inequity and such, and just so much more. But what also is happening is the challenge for the church to determine really where is our focus. I've heard it said since I was a young child, the church needs to stand up and be the church. The church needs to decide to be who God has called us to be. And really, it was pointing back to what Jesus speaks to us in chapter 19. What is the church thirsting for? What is the church hungry for? At one point, it seemed like we were really hungry for souls. Why would you say that, Pastor Hunt? Because at some point, it looks like we have transition of members transplanting from one place to the next and then I wonder sometimes are there really people getting saved I mean new folk I'm not talking about the folk that been saved getting saved again I'm, I'm not talking about the saint who's falling back with it now they got to get up we fall down and we get back up again I'm talking about those that do not know Christ those that have not heard the message that Jesus wanted us to utter those are the people that we now have to really put our attention to. I, I'm, I'm so excited about this revival that's coming. I'm telling you all, I, I'm turned up. Uh, uh, the kids say lit. I, I don't know all these new phrases, but what I do know, there's a bubbling, bubbling. See, I come from an old platform, an old school, where they said that bubbling, bubbling, bubbling down in my soul, singing and shouting because Jesus, come on, somebody has made me whole. I can't explain it. Woo! But what I know is down on the inside. Let me slow down just a minute. And so, so the, the cravings, the desire, the thirst speaks to Jesus as being one that is relatable. I told you three points. He's relatable. Somebody say relatable. See, I told you. Did we just do that? Call and response, but relatable. We see that Jesus speaking using two words that are familiar with us. And the truth of the matter is he really was thirsty. I mean, in the natural sense, he really was thirsty. Consider this. He hadn't had a meal or anything to drink since the Last Supper. Y'all remember the Last Supper? He leaves the Last Supper, and now he's in the place where the decision that he made in the garden is now where it was a private decision. It's now a public display. Getting ready and being set up for now like putting teeth to your words. I was preaching some weeks ago and I said, when the spirit of God is on us, then faith takes on Nikes. Nikes represent victory. When faith rests upon us or, or embraces or, or my God is so powerful through us, it causes us to take action. And get in a place where we become those that are so focused, we don't turn back because now we're up against, really, the things that matter most. And Jesus speaks to us uh, from a natural perspective. He shows us his humanity. So he's relatable. My mind comes to the scripture that says, we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but in all points, whoo, glory to God. Whatever it is you can imagine and think that you could go through or been through and you cried about and you felt like you were the one who went through the worst, you felt like you were victimized, but honey, come to the place where you understand by Jesus' words, been there, done that, and got the victory. And so we then celebrate because we have a relatable Christ, one who not only speaks of his natural experiences, his, his, his thirst, uh, we understand that Jesus has been hanging for hours. We know the story. He was beat, 
Many stripes, scorned, spat in the face, beard ripped. The story, the information is more detailed. But Jesus now has been placed on the cross and feeling what is natural. You know what? When you're in your final hour, I would imagine that the words that you wouldn't think of other times, they come more readily. I remember when my father, in his last day, had come home from the hospital. And the doctors had already said, this is his last, and we're not going to do anything else. We put him palatable treatment. He was moving into hospice. But my dad was so a praiser, he'd be worshiping, and sometimes I'd look at my siblings, I could see they weren't ready, Sister Smith. But the being made ready was the part that God called me to. So when I had my time alone with my father, he said, well, I, I had an Italian beef with some good old hole in the wall french fries. He said, I had a Polish sausage. I wanted the one, the Jewtown one. I didn't want the ones that just could come lately. He said, I had Italian beef. I had a Jewtown Polish. I, he said, I had a, a Big Mac. I said, Dad, did you eat all that? He said, I bit some of everything. He said, you know why? He said, because it's time. Your desire, your thoughts are much more pointed than other times. So I, I would imagine he was saying, look, if I'm going to leave here, let me just have a good time on my way out. I ain't got to worry about my blood pressure no more. I don't have to worry about any medication. I'm going to eat what I want to eat and go in Jesus' name. Then he sent us home. When he sent us home, he whispered to me. He said, well, you're back home. You've been on the road. Go get you some rest. I said, okay, daddy, you all right? He said, I'm tired. So I said, oh, you're tired? Well, you can get you some sleep. He said, no, no, no. No, 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 I'm, not. I'm tired. Now, he had, a, had these wonderful things to eat. He points and says, I'm tired. I'm, my humanity says, me too, because I just got off the plane. But it's deeper than that. Jesus says, I'm thirsty. And it speaks to another point. Well, he's responsible. His desire is so great that now he's pointed to what he's been assigned to do. And now greater than ever is the moment where I am ready. And so then the desire is really tied into his thirst. He says, if I be lifted up, there's going to come a time that I got to do this. He told them, I want to be with you always, but I, when I be lifted up, I, draw. I believe that in his responsible moment, that what he was thinking about, what, what he could see. See, vision is not that which is on the surface. It's that which does not appear on the surface. Well, he, he's now at a place where uh, he's looking beyond all that is happening around him as he hangs on Calvary. He thinks about the souls of men and women he saw me. And he saw you. That now my natural situation does not matter so much. But rather, what I sense is I see, I see, I see, I see. We come away saying, I see a crimson stream of blood that flows from Calvary. So he's relatable. He's responsible. And here, he's reliable. He's reliable. I told you I was going to reference St. John chapter 18. Verse number 8 says, Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. Let, let me back up verse 7. Then asked he of them, whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way. Yeah. Well, Jesus is saying, look, let's get on with it. Let's do what we have to do because as he was responsible, he took it. He said, I must be about my father's business. And we see him now pressing to it, pressing with, with agonies, hanging six hours, nothing to eat, nothing to drink. But he says, uh, he can depend on me. The question tonight is, can God depend on you? Can you stand as one that says you can count on me? We've heard it preached and we've heard it told to us over and over again that there is the responsibility to, uh, on us to be the visible Jesus for this world we live in. And then the question is, can he rely on us? 
Jesus is reliable. He says, look, I told you who I am, so let's get on with this, so to speak. Verse number 11 in that same 18 chapter of St. John. And Jesus said unto Peter, put away thy sword in thy sheath. He said, the cup which my father has given me, shall I not drink? Remember the cup? He says, shall I let this cup pass? And he comes with a statement that's so bold, nevertheless. Not my will, but, whoo, I feel God in this. Are you saying not my will, but the will of God? Despite of what's going on around you, are you pressed to the point that you feel like, God, I want you to know you can depend on me. You can count on me. No matter what happens, I will be willing to put my life, you see, see put my life on the line. Must Jesus bear this cross alone and all the world go free? You know what his thirst did? His thirst not only caused him to cry out and the soldiers gave him vinegar, but his thirst made him stay focused where he took it and realized it's so much greater than this, the bitter cup. His thirst took him to Calvary and he rose saying, all power is in my hand. His thirst was so great that it took the disciples to Jerusalem and the outpour took place. His thirst was so great woo, that Jesus stood in a place that put us where we could cry out to him and expect that he will hear us. Let's hear what Acts said. He said in Acts, as Luke speaks, he says, when the Spirit was poured out in one day, 3,000 souls we're at it. How do we view this? What is it that we're considering now as the question is placed on us? Are we relatable? Can people see us as somebody that God will use and feel the love of Jesus so much that they want what the love that we have, the relationship we have, the power we have? Responsible. Will they be those that will see us as believers standing with our shoulders rear back and ready, being those who are Issachar, understanding the times and knowing what we ought to do. Will we be those that stand reliable? That God, no matter what we go through, he knows. We'll say, I will trust in the Lord with all my heart. Woo! I won't lean to my own understanding, but in all my ways, I will acknowledge him so he can give me direction. You know what, church? This is an exciting time. This is the time where we get to see what we've dreamed of. This is the time we get to experience a power so great and a and, and movement that cannot be stopped that will cause us to be those that say, I thirst. Be sold out. God bless you in Jesus' name. Oh, the Lord, great praise. Give him real praise. Hallelujah. We praise the Lord tonight to welcome to uh, this pulpit on this Good Friday, someone relatively new to our city, but bold in his faith, uh, a young man. I told people that as I get older, I appreciate more and more what God is doing through others, that God is raising up men and women who love him with all their heart. The sixth word from Calvary's cross comes from the word of God again at the close. In verse number 30, when Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The newly brought in pastor from the Great Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church, our good friend, Pastor Reginald Sharp, Jr., give God praise as he comes in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm grateful to Bishop Horace Smith for extending to me this invitation to share the sixth phrase of Jesus tonight, and I am honored to stand with this great cadre of pulpiteers this evening. To Sister Smith, God bless you, and to all of you who have provided so much warm hospitality here at Apostolic Faith, thank you. My assignment tonight, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished 
and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. That's John 19, verse 30. I want to talk today from this thought very simply and briefly, prayerfully. The finish zone. The finish zone. Last Saturday, my wife Bree and I were bored out of our minds while trying to survive the bondage of quarantine. So she pulled out a board game called Trouble. I hadn't played the game in so long that I reached past the game because I needed the instruction manual. And as I was reading, I was quickly reminded why the game is called Trouble. It's not deep. It's called Trouble because each player tries to move their pieces forward. No matter how safe or focused you are, you keep bumping into trouble. Every move you make in the game, there is something or someone trying to set you back while you're working hard to go forward. The other day I was reflecting on a quote quote by Malcolm X which says I realize I'm saying some things that you think can get me in trouble but brothers I was born in trouble when I thought about the game called trouble and the thought about Malcolm X's quote about trouble I immediately started thinking about Jesus Jesus knew all about trouble because he was literally born in trouble his stepfather Joseph almost abandoned him his mother Mary didn't comprehend him Herod wanted to murder him. His parents had to hide him. His own community rejected him. The Pharisees challenged him. The Sadducees questioned him. The Zealots tried to rush him. The Gnostics tried to reinterpret him. The Jewish aristocracy dismissed him. The Roman Empire was intimidated by him. Jesus was born in trouble. Peter denied him. Thomas doubted him. Judas betrayed him. His followers deserted him. The Sanhedrin council arrested him. Pilate didn't acquit him. The soldiers tortured him. The thief mocked him. The empire lynched him. Death tried to defeat him. Jesus was born in trouble. And Isaiah from the 8th century prophecy, he got an epiphany of Calvary and he put it like this. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. Jesus was born in trouble and I don't know about y'all but I'm glad that I have a savior who knows what trouble feels like. He wasn't in trouble because he sinned. No. He was in trouble because he was fighting systems and whenever you try to do what's right there's always some antagonist or or some opposing force looking to start some trouble. Representative John Lewis calls it good trouble. And if you be real, all of us have been in some trouble before. Have you ever been lonely? Have you ever been misunderstood? Have you ever helped somebody and they stabbed you in the front? I'm talking about trouble. God knows America is in trouble. You know we're in trouble when you have an asinine, egomaniacal president still flexing his power while hundreds of thousands of people are fighting for their lives. You know you're in trouble when you have more than six million Americans who've applied for unemployment. You know you're in trouble when black people are ten times more likely to have the coronavirus because of underlying health issues and we still have to beg people to stay home as if this is a joke. We are in trouble. I guess that's why my grandma and them used to sing trouble in my way. I have to cry sometimes. I lay awake at night, but that's all right. It'll get fixed after a while. Well, 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 I told y'all that Bree and I were playing the game Trouble, but there's one thing I forgot to tell you. The only way to win the game of Trouble is to get all four of your pieces in what the game calls the finish zone. Before we started playing the game, I already told you I read the instruction manual, and I can't remember everything I read, but I do remember this, Bishop. It said once one of your pieces makes it into the finish zone, it's safe. The only way to stay out of trouble is to make it to the finish zone. All I came to tell you tonight is when Jesus cried, it is finished, he was letting heaven and earth know I've made it to the finish zone. 
hell. He was saying, I've done what I was sent to do. The debt has been paid. The crooked ways are straight. The rough places are smooth. Blind people can see. Lame people can walk. Captives are free. Jesus announced, it is finished, and I've made it to the finish zones. Now, those of you, those who were standing around that cross probably assumed that he was at his weakest or at his worst because they didn't know when you make it to the finish zone, you're safer than you've ever been before. So I encourage every soul listening to me tonight, do what you were sent to do. Be who you were made to be. Keep fighting for justice and equality. Stay at home and endure this pandemic. Keep laughing, crying, shouting, praying, and believing. Keep voting, protesting, pushing, dreaming, working, and forgiving. Be a voice for the voiceless. Be a blessing to the hurting. But one of these old days, when we're going to make it to the finish zone, the clouds will dissipate. The storms will pass. COVID-19 will lose its power over our flesh. The sun will come back out. The battle will one day be over. We may be in trouble right now, but we're on our way to the finish zone but if you're gonna win in this game I promise you you're gonna need the instruction manual I've read the manual and it says God is our refuge and our strength a very present help in trouble I've read the manual and it says for in the time of trouble God will hide me I've read the manual and it says let not your heart be troubled I've read the manual and it says a man born of a woman is of a few days and those days are full of trouble I've read the manual and it says for I reckon that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us I've read the manual and it says weeping may endure for a night but all joy is coming in the morning so when we make it in the finish zone there's only going to be one song that we're going to be able to sing I'm so glad that trouble uh oh oh somebody say trouble won't last always in the time of trouble, he's going to hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle. He's going to hide us. Hallelujah. Anybody here in the finished zone? Anybody here crossed over by the blood? Anybody here know you're safer now than you've ever been before? Give God a high five and praise him. Woo! My God, my God. I don't know where you are tonight. You may be in place, but get to the finish zone. It's already been paid for by the blood of Jesus. Wow. What a mighty God we serve. Wow. You can rest. It is finished. The finish zone the place of safety and security purchased by the blood of Jesus at the cross of Calvary. How the Lord closes his life is so powerful. I always marveled at our former president, Barack Obama, especially in his second term. He had vicious enemies all around him and they resorted to all kinds of shenanigans. And I think that what they were trying to do was get him off his game. And I can remember hearing from him and his staff about what he ought to do, how he ought to retaliate in the same way that they did. But he never did. And he said this to me, I'll never take the low road. Wow. What composure. What presence of mind to know the nature that you have been given by the Lord is a thing that will win the game for you. It sounds like Jesus in Luke 23. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he simply said, Father, 
into thy hands. I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. The pastor of New Life Covenant Southeast, our good friend, Pastor John Hanna, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 If, if you're online or in the building, can you open your mouth and just say hallelujah? Come on, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Make your home your sanctuary. Can you open your mouth wherever you are and just shout hallelujah? Wow, we honor the Lord for being here on tonight, and I thank God that he gave me an opportunity to come out the house. Hallelujah. Who would have ever thought that a grown man would be excited about getting outside and my wife wasn't going to let me come. She's a nurse at Northwestern and she said, the devil is a lie. I say, if we can't go to the doctor's church, who church can we go to? Amen. If any church ought to be right, it ought to be the doctor's church. And so I'm excited about being here tonight. Amen. And I'm going to be obedient. We have seven minutes. I'm going to pray that God would let me feel my Baptist anointing that I used to have when I was a kid. I want to do like Reverend Sharp. He did it in less than seven minutes. That ain't going to happen tonight. Listen, let me say this and I want to move on. Um, so the news came out and I want you to guys know what happened. He'll never tell you this, but I want, I want to tell you. I was on a phone call with the governor and all the religious leaders. And when they were talking about this virus, and on the phone call, it was Bishop that said, you need to give us specifics according to race as far as how this virus is affecting certain races. They never would approach that. And because he demanded it, the governor said, I need us to celebrate who we have and what we have. I need you to celebrate who we have. They never would have released that information had he not put a demand on them. And we knew that they had the answer, but they said, Bishop, let us get back with you. And what I found amazing is that once Illinois exposed it, then the world or the United States began to pay close attention so that everybody could be awakened. And so I want you to know that I salute you on tonight. Um, no one even knows that I was on that phone call. I never said a word. I paid attention, though. And the Lord told me, just maintain your position. See, my position is just to pray. And everybody needs to know somebody's going to start a, you know, a, a petition. Somebody's going to, but some people are just called to be an intercessor. And every time somebody called me, well, what do you think? I says, I have no thoughts. My assignment is only to get the people of God to God. Because if I don't know anything else, I know that he hears and he answers. So let's go and let's just stay in the vein of prayer. So I'm assigned to the last number seven, Luke 23 and 46. And he called out with a loud voice. Wherever you are, can you just say with a loud voice? And then the first words out of his mouth were father. Can everybody open your mouth and just say father? And then the third words out of his mouth was into your hands. I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, <sighs> he breathed his last breath. He had walked the earth for three and a half years and had done exactly what he had been sent to do. And it is my prayer that we can say that when we've taken our last breath, that we have done exactly what we were sent to earth to do. It is imperative that you pay attention to how he chooses to close us. I like three closings. Number one, he told the disciples, go ahead of me, for there's a room that has already been prepared 
prepared. Everybody hear me and hear me clearly. Everything he wants is already on the earth. And you are a piece of the puzzle. The Bible says that when they go in, go ahead of him, the room is prepared. He says, prepare the room and we're coming up, coming up behind you. Watch me. He takes the disciples into a room and locks them in. For everyone that's feeling as if you're having a lock-in, it's for such a time as this. This is not the first lock-in. Man has been here before. When he locks the door, it is imperative that you pay attention to who you choose to lock in with. He literally hand-picked 12 who he chose to be on lockdown with. The Bible lets us know that three lessons are taught right there in the room. Lesson number one, let me teach the disciples that your life is about servitude. It is, I chose you not to be all of that in a bag of chips, but I chose you to serve. You will live your life with an apron. They were in the room arguing over who's going to be great, but lock-ins prove that nobody is great. Come on, let's talk for a minute. He began to serve them. He fed them. He washed them. In the room, he then went to the second lesson, which is the lesson of exposure. The Bible lets us know that he literally dipped and say, he that dippeth his hand in the bowl with me is the same one that's going to trick on me. Can we talk for a minute? In your lock-in, God has a way of exposing your Judases. You will find out who's really with you and who's not with you. And you're going to find out it's going to be some people that you fed. Can we talk for a minute? It, watch me. And you have to be okay with God exposing your Judases. This is the season in a lock-in that you have to be okay with who's not going to call you, who's not going to check on you, who will only with you to get what they wanted from you. And I need you to pay attention. I need you to let your Judases go. If you pay attention, he did not leave the table running after one when he still had 11 sitting at the table. Saints of the living God, I need God to expose your Judases during this season. So when you come out, you don't have any dead weight around you. Come on here. Where you are, can you do me a favor? Can you lift your hands and say, God, show me my Judases? The third lesson that we learn in the room is that he builds. Who does he build? He builds Peter. Please pay attention. Because many of you all, this is a season that you're going to find out that you're not as deep as you thought you were. You're not as spiritual as you thought you were. You're not as uh, all of that. Come on here. The truth is about to be told. He looked at Peter and said, Peter, I need you to hear me. The devil desires to sift you as wheat. But listen to this. But I've already prayed for you. Listen, you are going to let me down. Here's my line. But when you get up, I'm going to need you to strengthen your brother, which means that you're going to have a down day, but you can't stay there. I'm going to need you to have a bounce back anointing. So when you bounce back, you're going to have to strengthen somebody else to let them know that they don't have to stay down there. I don't know who I'm talking to, but since this lock-in, God has been building you and letting you know that your down days are not going to be long. Can we talk for a minute? Then he shifts to the second location location, which is the garden. And I need you to pay attention. You got to be careful as you get closer to your destiny, everybody can't go with you. He then handpicks three that can go further. The problem with this lock-in is that some of y'all are having withdrawals from people who you want to go further with you, but God won't allow them to go through this season with you. Can you do me a favor wherever you are? Just lift your hands and say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. The Bible lets us know that he handpicks three disciples and he teaches three lessons in the garden. Number one, he commits to prayer. The Bible says that he prays three times. Here's the line I want you to get. He prayed three times and the Bible says, and the third time, watch this, he said the same thing. Which means that sometimes your prayers have to be keep being repeated until you see a breakthrough. Never feel as if you're wasting time 
God is teaching you how to press in prayer. The next lesson that he taught them was submitting, submitting to the will of God. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Which means that it comes a time that it's a wrestle between your spirit and your flesh. And watch me, in bringing your flesh under subjection ain't easy. I am so sick of faith, phony, hypocritical church people who act like you ain't got to fight. If Jesus had to fight, what make you think you ain't got to fight? I got to fight from not cussing you out. I got to fight from not putting my hands on you. I got to fight for not getting in my flesh. Not as I will, God, but as you will. Come on here. Open your mouth and say it's like a struggle sometimes. It makes me, that's an old song, Bishop. It makes me wonder how I keep from going under. I'm sorry. Let's go here. And then he permits. What do you mean he permits? He permit people to be themselves. He came back to the disciples, watch me, and they were asleep. Watch me. I need you to permit people to be themselves. The hardest thing sometimes is that we expect people to be like us. Mm, come on here. He permits them to sleep. Then he permits Judas to kiss him. I permit you to turn on me. I permit you to dog me out. I'm not going to pull back. I'm going to lean in. Why am I leaning in? Because I can't be who God want me to be until you do what you're supposed to do. I'm going to permit you to lie on me. I'm going to permit you to talk about me. I'm going to permit you to be jealous of me. I'm going to permit you to dog, on, dog me out. And I'm going to lean in and take it. And then the Bible lets us know that he would. He, watch me, after he permits, watch me, then he is arrested. After he's arrested, arrested for what? Have you ever asked, what did we do to deserve to be here? And some of you all can't come up with anything, but you have been arrested. Then he is tried. Have you ever felt as if your faith is on trial even now? The Bible lets us know that he is tried. Not only is he tried, but then he's convicted. Not only is he convicted, but then he is beaten. If you search the Old Testament, the Bible says, watch me, he is beaten beyond recognition. There comes a point sometimes that you can be beat down so bad that you don't look like yourself, that you don't act like yourself. And then after he is beaten, then he is hanged. Can we talk for a minute? Now watch me. Hanging is not easy. Watch me, because now is the real test. Because who you were off the cross is who you're expected to be on the cross. Can we talk? If you snapped off, you're going to snap on. If you cussed off, you're going to cuss on. But if you prayed off, you're going to pray on. If you praise off, you're going to praise on. If you believe God off, you're going to believe God on. Come on, I know you at home and it's Good Friday. And some of y'all feel like you've been hanging. Must Jesus bear the cross alone? And all the world go free. No, my sisters and my brother, there's a cross for you and me. Do me a favor. Can you just throw your hands up like you're hanging? And I need you to open your mouth and just say, yes, Lord. Come on, y'all. Open your mouth and just say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Now, allow me just to give you this, and I'm done. I love a good organ player. Listen, to, you're just going to make a brother preach, huh? Listen, allow me to give you this. He prayed before he got on the cross. He prayed he prayed alone. He prayed publicly. He prayed corporately. He prayed before meals. He prayed after meals. He prayed before he even made important decisions. He prayed all night before he picked the 12 disciples. He prayed for healing. He prayed after healing. He prayed to do the Father's will. He did it so much that the disciples says, can you teach us how to do what you do? For those of you that are listening right now, I am amazed at the number of believers that don't have a prayer life. Hmm. Come on, let's talk. This is a season that your emotions won't work. This is a season that you're going to be pressed in prayer. Everybody hear me and hear me clearly. This thing will only turn when we cry out to God. Watch me, please pay attention. While we're hanging, we're expected to travail. Come on, let's talk for a minute. Uh, what do you mean by that? He prayed. When you look at the seven last sayings, out of the seven, number one was a prayer. 
He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Can we talk? Two, watch me. He said, today, he says, he says, he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Three, he says, woman, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother. Four, stop, is a prayer. So one is a prayer, four is a prayer. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Then he goes on, I thirst. Then he says, it is finished. And then number seven is a prayer. Stop. One is a prayer. Let's start with prayer. Four is a prayer. In the middle with prayer. Let's end with a prayer. Shut up. How you been hanging? Have you been praying? Come on, you can't come down until you pray. <laughs> come on, everybody stand if you're in the building. We're about to get ready to go. I'm about to turn it over. How, how you been hanging? Let's talk for a minute. Can I give you this? And everybody that is online, I need you to hear me. I need you to hear me. You can't move. You are there. He sees where you are, and he's leaning in to hear what comes out of your mouth. You got to hear me. Number one was a prayer. Number four was a prayer. Number seven is a prayer. So how does he pray? The first thing out of his mouth is the prayer of victory. Can we talk for a minute? What do you mean by that? He, the Bible says he cried, please pay attention, with a loud voice. Please listen. One thing the enemy can't stand is to hear the sound coming out of you. Because every time you open your mouth, you remind him of his position he used to have. Watch me. He's attracted to sound. And the Bible says he lifted up and cried with a loud voice. Everybody pay attention. Please watch me. Why do you say a loud voice? Because that's what he's surrounded by. When he sits in heaven, there are four beasts that fly back and forth. The Bible says, and the 24 elders open their mouth and begin to release a sound, which means that wherever you are, there's a sound that has to be in your atmosphere. Hold on, bro. Now watch me. What the enemy is doing is that he's muzzling you. But guess what? Because you don't have a praise team at your house. You don't have a band at your house. So what you telling God is, the only time I can release a sound is if I'm around somebody else. But he, he was hanging by himself, which means that your sound has to be independent. What does it mean? He can distinguish your voice from anybody else's voice. As a lot of kids can be crying, but a parent knows the cry of their children. I don't know where you are right now, but I'm going to give you a moment. Watch me. It has to be the sound of victory. You can't be like, oh, God, no, no. No, no. Why is it a sound of victory? Because you are a survivor. Because you have made it beyond further than you ever thought that you could make it. Wherever you are right now, can you lift your hands and open your mouth and just release the sound of victory? Glory! Glory! Come on, y'all. I need you to release a sound. Glory! Come on, in your house, wherever you are, open your mouth and release a sound. Glory. Hallelujah. Glory. Yes. Come on, in your house. I need you to release a sound in your house. I need your children to hear you. I need your neighbor to hear you. I need your family to hear you. Open your mouth while you hang. You've been shouting in church for years. You've been shouting in the pulpit for years. But can you shout in your house? <laughs> Ready? Ready? Because who you were off the cross is who you expected to be on the cross. Don't just dance when you're in the building. But while you're in your house, you need to go to YouTube and put on some shout music. 
and start dancing while you hanging and give God a victory. Hold on. Let's go. You ready? So the first one is the prayer of victory. The second one is the prayer of intimacy. Because he called him father. Who do you say he is right now? For everyone in the sound of my voice, I need you to build up your vocabulary so that you could woo God in your direction. Come on here. He hears enough complaints. He's so sick of CNN, NBC, and Fox News. And some of y'all are repeating the news more than you talking about your God. So I need you to tell them who he is. These are the words of adoration. If you don't mind, can we just take 60 seconds and just adore him? Come on, open. Who do you say he is? I call you great. I call you mighty. I call you wonderful. I call you the God of my salvation. I call you the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I call you the great I am. I call you my savior. I call you my deliverer. I call you my father. I call you the very present help in the time of trouble. I call you my God. I call you my deliverer. I call you my healer. I call you my way maker. I call you my everything. I call you the lover of my soul. I call you my everything. I call you my God. I call you my God. I call you my God. Come on. Just a few more seconds. Open your mouth. I need you to get intimate with God. I call you my deliverer. I call I call you my healer. 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 I call you my way maker. I call you my savior. I call you my savior. I call you my hero. I call you my Superman. I call you my everything. Who do you say he is? Glory. Father. Healer. Deliverer. Way maker. Peace, joy, King of kings, Lord of lords. Come on, where you are, lift your hands. Have an intimate moment with God. Go! Go! How you hanging? Go! wherever you are, if you don't mind, and I see you sit in your living room, you have it up on your big screen. Can you do me a favor wherever you are? Can you stand? Can you stand? Can you do me a favor? Can you turn off HGTV? Can you zone in right now for just a few seconds? Can you turn off Netflix? Can you not be distracted for a few minutes? While you're standing there, can you do something for me? Can you open your mouth and say, I trust you? Everybody hear me. Come on, say, I trust you. Come on, come on. I need you to say this, I trust you. Come on, lift your hands and tell the Lord, I trust you. Come on, tell the Lord, you got me, you got me, you got me. Just take it down, Jay. You got me, you got me. Come on, tell them, you got my house, you got my children, you got my body, you got my city, you got my city, you got my country, you got my church, you got everything that concerneth me. Come on, tell God, you got it, you got it, you got it. Come on, that's the third prayer. When he say, into thy hands, I commit. That's the prayer of committal, which means I take my hands off of it and I give it to you and I know that all things Things are going to work together for your good. Just for like 10 seconds, everybody begin to lift your hands and begin to commit it to God. Come on, give it to God. 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 I need you to hear me. And he took his last breath into your hands. Basically, the son hands it to the father, say, you got it from this point on. Because they're going to take my body off this cross. They're going to wrap me up. They're going to put me in a tomb. They're going to seal it. They're going to put guards in it. 
But I've already spoken what you told me. That on the third day, I'm going to get up. So it's in your hands to get me up. And for some of y'all in this building and that are listening to me, I need you to turn it over to God and let him know that you got it and I commit it to you. I give you my family. I give you my job. I give you my concerns. I give you my issues. Come on, lift your hands wherever you are as I turn the mic over. As I turn the mic over. As I turn the mic over, because I'm going to need you to breathe. I'm going to need you not to be in panic mode. I'm going to need you not to be in worry mode. I'm going to need you not to worry about it's going to end the way he told you. It's going to end the way he told you. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be good. Our God is bigger than any situation. But I need to know if you could hang there and let God know. You got it. You got it. Come on, just say that about five times. You got it. You got it. You got it. You got it. So now my assignment is complete. Church, I beg you, push in prayer. This won't turn until we begin to cry out to our God. Don't you cry for a position. Don't you cry for your selfish reasons. I need you to ask God to heal the earth, to reverse this thing, and that we could see a miracle. Lift your hands and worship God right there as I turn the mic over. And remember, commit it to God. Hallelujah. Don't, don't leave, don't leave. I need those pastors to come up on the pulpit. You can, you'll still be six feet away, don't worry. But uh, Pastor Hannah, every year during Holy Week, we receive thousands of requests from around the world. We nail them to this cross every year, and we beseech God for it. Tonight, your last word emphasized the power of prayer. This cross represents people from every nation, at least 35 different nations, every state of the union. I want these pastors and you, I want you to lead us, and we're going to intercede. We've taken the electronic requests and we've written them on pages of paper. We've got some others we received tonight. They'll be attached later. We're going to stretch our hands for Chicago, the U.S. Yes, come, Can come around in a circle. circle. Pastor Hannah, lead us as we intercede for people for those of you that are around at your the home, world. Can you stretch your hands towards your iPad, towards your phone, towards your in the name of television? Jesus. So in God, you hear Jesus. us in the name. Hold of the Jesus. music. Hold the music. In the name of Jesus. You hear us. Glory. You Do know it, Lord. us. Do it, Lord. You know what we have need of before we even ask you. You are a very present help in the time of trouble. And we cry out to the God of our salvation. We cry out to our healer, our deliverer, our way maker. We open our mouths all over the world. And God, we cry out to you. You are our source. You are our deliverer. You are our healer. You are our way maker. And God, what father ignores the cries of his children? God, you would not go down for neglect. But God, God, you know us and you know what we stand in need of. So God, tonight we even stand as we intercessors and we open our mouths and we cry out for everything that is on this cross. He wrote We cry out for every house. We cry out for every family. We cry out for every man. We cry out for every woman. We cry out for every child. We cry out for every city. We cry out for every country. We cry 
cry out for every church. We ask God that you begin to do this thing immediately. We call on the name that is able. God, we don't ask in our names. We ask in the name of Jesus. Jesus. You say what Whatsoever we ask, Lord, we ask in that name that you, you would do it for you us. Do. You said if we touch and agree about anything, anything, God, anything, God, anything, God, God, so God, tonight, you said if we touch and agree about anything, God, so God, tonight, we ask and we believe that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly. God, we stretch our hands and we expect a miracle. We expect you to do what only you could do. And God, you will be glorified. Let your glory be revealed. 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 We expect testimonies. We expect victory reports. We give you glory in advance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it is so. It is so. And it is so. It is so. And it is so. It is so. And we will see it. And we will hear it. And we will touch it. And we will hear it. And we will see it. And we will touch it. And we will hear it. And we will see it. And we will touch it. And we will hear it. And we will see it. And we will touch it. And we will hear it. And we will see it. In Jesus' name. And we will touch it. In Jesus' name. <laughs> Everyone open your mouth and say, I'm expecting miracles. I'm oh, expecting da, da, miracles. Da, Come on, give the Lord praise. Come on, everybody. Praise Him for the victory right now. Come on, praise God for the victory in prayer, the power of prayer, the presence of the Lord. Pastors, don't leave yet. One of the major things we want to do tonight, and if you have to leave, we understand, but there are thousands of families who have stopped by the church in the last three days. There are thousands on thousands who have come by to pick up communion elements. They picked up elements for their families. We prayed for them. And we said tonight, we're going to all participate in communion together. Thousands of families in their living room, in their places of their home. I have a number of pastors who came by, received elements for their churches, and took them one by one to families. And tonight, wherever you are, you've, you've been prayed for, we, we believe God, and now we want to enact communion. I want you, wherever you shelter in place right now, stand with us and receive, take those elements that you received in your hand. In the name of Jesus. I'm going to ask the pastors, come down with me. In the name of Jesus. We'll, we'll still be six feet apart. We're not worried about that. In, in our church, we, we believe very strongly that there is a, a presence of the Lord Jesus Christ with us when we break bread and receive the wine that is unmatched. Somebody come on this side. Come over here. He, he's all right. He's a good guy. Those of you in the audience, say where you are. Bear with me for a few minutes. We're almost done. But there are a thousand standing with us right now. In the name of Jesus. Pastor, would you take this the ones who are in the physically here, can you just line up and come down and receive the bread and receive the wine and go back to your seat and don't partake until it's time for those at home will join with us. Come quickly. Go back to your seat. The Lord said, I will be in the midst thereof. He's everywhere, but I will tell you, I believe that supernaturally the Lord is in the elements. I believe supernaturally the healing takes place. I believe supernaturally that in this time of COVID and fears and doubts, that the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of Calvary's cross 
will be unleashed in your family. You're sheltered in place, but get ready to partake with us. Get ready right now in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. We're going to partake together across Chicago, Indiana. There are thousands again who've come by and they stand with us right now. I thank the Lord for Pastor Winston, Pastor Franz. Uh, who else? Winston Thompson, Pastor Yolanda Hunt's church. They're all standing with us. Pastor Franz, that's right. Others. Pastor Eddie Richards, that's right. Bishop Eddie Richards, his church. They're standing. Has everyone been served? Have our musicians been served? They have? Good, good. The Bible says, let a person examine themselves. homes, wherever you are, open the seal. Hold it up before the Lord. The Lord said on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. Look, he blessed the bread, just like he's blessed your life. He then broke the bread and then he gave it to each of them. He said to them these words, take, eat, this is my body. It is broken for you. You may be sheltered in place, but the power of his body is with you now. You may have lost a loved one, but I pray the body of the Lord Jesus Christ will gain you sustenance, gain you victory, gain you power over every doubt and fear in the name of the Lord. He said, eat ye all of it. Let's eat together in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My Lord. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your body. Thank you for being broken beyond recognition. But once you're broken, you're able to be given. And we praise you. The same night, he took the cup. He said, this is my blood. This is the payment, the down payment, the redemptive power. He says these words, in the last few years I've become so attached to what he said afterward. He said, with a great desire, I desire to drink this cup with you 
Then he made them a promise of return. And I can't wait, he said, till I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. He's coming back for us. He's coming back for us. But until he comes, his blood, the power of his blood will cover your life. Drink ye all of it in the name of Jesus. Let's give the Lord praise right now. Hallelujah. Just for me. Just for me. He did it just for me. Oh my. Jesus came and did it just for me. Yes, he did. Oh my Lord. Jesus came. Jesus came. Yes, he did, oh my, oh my, Jesus came and did it just for me, my Lord, Jesus came and did it just for me. Listen, wherever you are, wherever you are, if you don't know Jesus, Call that number on the screen. Call that number or call the number of any church here represented at this pulpit. All of these men and women of faith, you know them. Call their number. I will guarantee you whatever your need may be, Christ will answer it. When you call that number, somebody that knows Jesus is going to connect with you in a way you have never been connected before. I don't care where you are, on what continent, at what state. I don't care your status. In the name of the Lord, deliverance has been purchased at Calvary's cross, and he's available tonight for you. In the ensuing days, I want you to be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. I want you to reach and connect with others, not physically, but in the spirit. I want you to know that COVID-19 is nowhere near as powerful as the blood of Jesus. His blood will cover. His blood will heal. His blood will make you whole. His blood is significant in your life now. We come against everything against you, and we believe by the blood of Jesus. Even tonight, to the thousands who have come by and shared with us, I bless God for you. Listen, if you want to sow a seed, again, you see the instructions on the screen. Do just that. Look, we're looking forward to Sunday morning, resurrection. We're going to close as the praise singers give us a selection. You can't touch and agree in a physical way, but you can in a powerful way. I want to give God praise for all these pastors. Come on, celebrate. Celebrate with them. Pray for them. Dr. Hannah said the most important thing, pray for your leaders. Many of them are being squeezed in the vine press. But God has a reason and a purpose to get the church out of itself into the world to do a work for him. We believe in God together like never before. God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. We'll see you soon in Jesus' name.